Thank you for tuning in today. Whether you are tuning in live or you are catching us on demand anytime during the week, maybe you're traveling abroad or you're right there at home, we thank you for being a part of what Gospelite is doing here in Anderson, South Carolina. But one of the things we wanna tell you today is that we desire for this to be a great opportunity for you to tune in if you are unable to be here live. There is no substitute for the local church and for local gatherings as we gather as a community. In that community, we find accountability and growth. We find opportunity to serve and we have a chance to see firsthand what it means to be part of the body of Christ. So we ask you to come one of our services, whether it be on uh, Sunday morning or whether it be one of our gatherings throughout the week in light groups, we ask you to be a part of it. Come grow with us. Church, we need each other. We need community. And we love you. Good morning, Gospel Light. How are we doing, 1030 crowd? And y'all look good this morning. Y'all stand up. We're going to sing this morning. Listen, we got a reason to sing. We got a reason to worship this morning. So you guys lift your voices. Y'all sing with us. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul. Worship His holy. sing with us. The sun
draws near and my time has come on oh, my soul will sing your praise
Eye and welcome to church. Here's the top things you need to know this week. The Church of the Week is Fellowship Baptist Church. Pray for Pastor Ray Arnett and his wife Jennifer. GLS, youth tonight, you know the drill. We've got a ladies pool party Saturday, July 23rd. Click the link on the Church Center app to sign up for a potluck dish. Our mission's focus for the month is the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Pray for this awesome ministry. Ladies, Lifeway Women Live in Atlanta, Georgia, August 26th and 27th. Deposits are due today. August 1st, Westside Band Camp. We will be serving up food and the gospel. Want to join the church and serve on the Dream Team? Growth Track is the place to be and get involved. Coming August 24th, stay tuned for more info. We are so glad you're here today. If you haven't downloaded the Church Center app, what are you waiting for? That's how we communicate to you and how you can join groups and events we have coming up. Now let's worship together. Do we really get coffee and donuts like Jason said last week? So the title of this next song is Who Am I? And as we prepare to perform it this week, it dawned me is such a simple question, but a profound one that's really asked in two ways. Who am I more of a focus on identity? The Bible clearly tells us who we are. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, verse 1, But now, says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, and I have called you by your name, you are mine. And then the other way that that question could be asked is, who am I from a, a worthiness perspective, something that I've struggled with a lot in my walk with the Lord? It's the, these feelings that we're not worthy of His grace and His mercy. And the Bible tells us that uh, we are worthy because He says so. In the same book, 10 chapters later in Isaiah 53, 5. But He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon Him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with His wounds, we are healed. So Lord, we just ask You that You give us the humility and the courage to accept Your wonderful gift. But because of what you've done, 
But because of what I've done But because of who you are I am a flower quickly fading Here today and lost tomorrow A wave tossed in the ocean A vapor in the wind Still you hear me when I'm calling Lord, you catch me when I'm falling And you told me who I am I am your I am your sin would look on me with love you watch me rise again who am I that the voice that come to see would call out through the rain and calm the storm in me not because Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am now quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow. A wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind. Still you hear me when I'm calling. Lord, you catch me when I'm falling, and you told me who I am. I am Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am now a quickly fading, here today and on tomorrow. A wave tossed in the ocean. It's good to see everybody this morning. How are you today? Good. All right. It's good to see you here. Let's open our Bibles together to the book of Ephesians for one final time in this series. I have the privilege of finishing out the book of Ephesians. We've been here for almost a year, possibly more. I can't remember the exact date we started this, but it's been for most of the last year that we've been going through the book of Ephesians, and I just personally want to say this has helped me tremendously 
And if we have any visitors here this morning, I haven't preached the entire series. Chad has preached the majority of it. So he has, he has blessed me and he has encouraged me. But we are going to, to wrap up this series today and we're going to be looking at four verses. Just four final verses in this chapter. And, you know, I don't know if you've done a, a, a reading plan going through the whole Bible or through certain books. But when you get to certain part, places in the Bible, it, it seems like some of the stuff you just kind of blur through it, right? And a lot of places in the Old Testament, you can kind of get stuck trying to figure out the context for the culture and different things like that. But at the end of books, even in the New Testament, a lot of times we'll get to these verses and we'll just be like, okay, that was just a, a little note that was tacked on the end. But this is actually incredibly important for us this morning, and I believe that these verses are going to give us a glimpse behind the scenes of what God is doing in the church through the life and the ministry of the Apostle Paul. So I uh, invite you to uh, engage this morning with the text. Yes, it's just four verses, and by the time we get to the end, you're going to be glad it was just four verses. Because if it was any more than that, I'm not sure how long this would take. But for these four verses, I'm excited to spend our time here this morning. And while you're getting to Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 21, I heard a story a while back about Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. Now, this isn't a joke. That sounds like the start of a good joke, right? I usually don't tell jokes, and you're welcome for that. But Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, actually two of the most... Uh, successful, world successful men and the wealthiest men in, you know, the world today, two very different people were invited to meet. And uh, actually, neither one of them were even interested in meeting the other one. They're like, we have nothing in common. What's the point? One's like this tech nerd, and the other one spent all of his time buried in the stock market, picking stocks. And so these two billionaires... Like, we're basically forced into this meeting that Bill Gates' mother was hosting. So that, that explains you to you how they actually got to the table. And they actually clicked and became lifelong friends. And it was at one point during this dinner that Bill Gates' mother asked everybody at the table to write down one word that was the most important factor in their success. So picture this, a table full of very successful people by a worldly standard. And she asked them all to write down one word. And interestingly enough, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett both, both wrote down the exact same word. And I almost bet you that some of you guys could guess what this word was this morning. They both wrote down the word focus. And it's hard to disagree when these two men say that this has been such an important factor in their lives. And if you've ever read leadership books or listened to a leadership podcast, you know how important focus is in our lives. Whether we're talking about the business world, our personal lives, or in the Christian life. Listen to some of these quotes. Uh, these are some of the most popular quotes on the internet for focus. Always remember, your focus determines your reality. Another person said, our focus is our future, and what we focus on will multiply in our lives. The great theologian and philosopher Bruce Lee once said, the successful warrior is an average man with laser-like focus. And I think he's exactly right. Another author and speaker said, most people have no idea of the giant capacity we can immediately command when we focus all of our resources on mastering a single area of our lives. One of my favorite ones is this quote. The author said, focus is more important than genius. That gives all of us non-geniuses hope, right? <laughs> focus is more important than genius because focus is very powerful. There's a reason why there's so much focus on this topic of focus in our world because it works. It's effective. Just 
Just think about it. Any arena of life, whether it's sports or business or families or church, whatever it is, focus is so important. But there's also a danger that is associated with focus. And we have the success stories, guys like Bill Gates or Warren Buffett, where their focus has paid off for them. But how many of you guys remember the name Kodak? Kodak was one of the most uh, successful companies back in the day. They controlled over 90% of the market share of what industry? Film, photography. They were leaders in their field. They seemed to be an unbeatable giant, but today they are out of business. Why is that? Is it because they weren't focused? No, actually, that is the exact opposite of why they went out of business. Their one glaring and fatal mistake was that they were focused on the wrong thing. They were focused, but they were focused on the wrong thing. Kodak believed that their strength was their brand and their marketing. And the thing that made them famous was classic film. And when the world started transitioning to digital... They had this big discussion and they had to make this decision. What are we going to do? Well, guess what they decided to go with? What they had always done, what had always been their focus. And in their meetings, I mean, they could have written a book to say, hey, we just need to focus on the right thing. But they chose to focus on the wrong thing. And here's the crazy, ironic thing about this. Kodak invented the digital camera. Yet they chose... Not to go in that direction, and it ultimately proved to be the worst decision of their company's history, and it bankrupt them, and they're no longer in business. And here's what I want to tell us this morning. If you work hard enough, and if you focus intensely enough, you can achieve just about anything. We've proved as human beings, we can achieve just about whatever we want to achieve, right? Right? Good, bad, ugly, it doesn't matter. We can set our mind, laser focus, and we can achieve just about anything. There's a reason the self-help or the personal development industry is valued at over $11 billion today. But I have a question for us. Are we making the same mistake that Kodak made? What if we live our entire life and we focus on the wrong things. Evangelist D.L. Moody once said, Our greatest fear should not be of failure, but of succeeding at something that doesn't matter. So what are we focused on this morning? What are we trying to succeed at? The author of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul, was a man who lived a focused life, a laser Focus life. He's the guy who wrote these words. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press toward the mark or the goal for the prize. He understood the importance of focus. This is actually a biblical principle. But what was his mark? What was his prize? What was the goal that he was pressing towards? What was he laser focused on? He said, I press toward the goal for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He was living a life that echoed the words of Jesus when Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Paul was a man who lived a focused life and he was focused on the right thing. And I want to invite you to read along with me as I read our text this morning. And this is God's word for God's people. Verse 21. So that you may also know how I am doing and what I am doing. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose that you may know how we are. And that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers. And love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be to you 
or grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. This is Paul's farewell address after writing this incredible book to the church at Ephesus. And he closes it out by giving us a glimpse into what he is focused on in his life. Let's pause and take a moment to go to the Lord in prayer this morning and invite the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts through what we've read this morning. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word. Lord, I thank you that it is true. Lord, I thank you that it is effective. And you've given it to us this morning for such a time as this for a purpose. And I pray that you would help us to focus on your word this morning. May we look to you for wisdom and for truth. Please open our eyes to see, open our hearts to hear and understand your truth and your will for our lives this morning. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So these four verses, this short passage, this farewell that's tacked on at the end of this book, gives us a glimpse into life's Paul's focused life. So what is it that Paul focused on? Four things this morning. Number, number one, Paul is focused on others rather than himself. Paul's focused on others rather than himself. Listen to how he starts off this farewell. He says, so that you may also know how I am doing and what I am doing. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. So Paul is focused on others, and the first group that we see he's focused on rather than himself is the church at Ephesus. Paul planted the church in Ephesus. He's in prison. He's separated from the church. But while he's there, he's thinking about the church. And he sits down to write this letter to the church, and he honors them in this letter. Just this closing farewell honors the church. He doesn't treat them like they are inferior, like they're second-rate Christians, like, oh, I'm the Apostle Paul, and you're just this little church that I planted. No, he's focused. Everything he's doing is serving this church, and he's loving these people. He's actually accountable to them. He's writing to them, sharing with them about his ministry and what he's doing, and he actually sends a message through this guy named Tychicus, that is going to deliver the letter, he had more to tell them about the details that Paul didn't take time to write down. So he's honoring the church. He's also encouraging the church. He knows that they're being attacked from within and without. He knows the culture is attacking the church. He knows the culture is trying to permeate and change the church from the outside. But he also knows that from the inside there are false teachers that are trying to corrupt the gospel. And he also knows that, the, as we talked about last week, that every single person in this church is struggling with the world, their own flesh, and the devil. So he's sending this man to them to encourage, and he's sending this letter to them to encouraging them, to encourage their lives, and to be an encouragement. He also not only honors, encourages, but he also gives them instruction in their life. He's teaching them in this letter this is an act of love this is an act of service he's teaching them what they need to be able to stand they needed the truth they needed to know the truth of the gospel of God's word and Ephesians was specifically written to them for their needs for what they were going through not only do we see he's focused on the church of Ephesus but he also mentions one of his co-laborers this man named Tychicus. Now, I don't know how many of you know very much about him, but he's one of the people in Scripture that not much is written about. Now, there are people in Scripture that their name is just mentioned one time, and, and we just hear in passing. There are other people like this man who 
just a few times, four or five times, their name is mentioned, and then we don't ever hear anything else about them. And then there are some people that, like, over and over and over and over, like the Apostle Paul, you just constantly hear all throughout Scripture, the book of Acts, all the epistles that Paul writes, he's all throughout, and we know a ton about him, but what about this man that we don't know very much about? Why is he so important in Paul's ministry? Well, in the five references that we see in Ephesians, Colossians, Acts, 2 Timothy, and Titus, we realize that Paul sent this man to the church at Ephesus when he was in prison to deliver this letter. He also sent him to the church at Colossae and the church, uh, or to Philemon to deliver this letter to him on behalf of this man named Onesimus. We believe that Tychicus was the one, according to scripture, who delivered all of these letters. He also traveled with the Apostle Paul on his missionary journeys, sharing the gospel. He served him. He wasn't in the spotlight. He wasn't in the limelight. He wasn't the one everybody wanted to come hear him preach. But he was serving faithfully and doing exactly what the Holy Spirit and the Apostle Paul asked him to do. He was actually on Paul's third missionary journey When he went from Ephesus back to Jerusalem, the final time where he was bound, arrested, and sent to Rome to stand before Caesar. Another thing we learn in scripture about this man is that he was an interim pastor. When Paul was in prison, about to be executed in his second imprisonment, he wanted Timothy to come to him. So guess who he sent to pastor the church in Ephesus so Timothy could leave? And come to see him in prison in Rome. Tychicus. He was the man who went to fill in for Timothy. We also see he, we believe that he did the exact same thing on the island of Crete for Titus, who was the pastor of the church there. He's one of the unknown or little known servants of God in the New Testament. But he made a huge impact for Jesus Christ. This is how Paul, his friend, describes him. Paul says that he is a friend, he's a faithful minister, and he's a fellow servant of God. How would you like for your life to be described in that way? This is how the Apostle Paul summarizes this guy. And we know the Apostle Paul was not a guy who was scared to step on people's toes. He didn't just walk around with flowery speech trying to make people feel better. He was not a flatterer. He was the one who told John Mark, you're not welcome to come with me because you're not profitable. You quit. He wrote another letter and talked about another man who gave up in the middle of the the fight and went back home. Paul said, "I I don't want to have anything to do with him. But he's talking about this guy as a friend, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant of God. And as I studied about this man's life this week, it made me stop and ask a question of myself. Am I willing to serve and be unknown so that Jesus Christ can be known? Am I willing to spend my life focused on somebody else? Am I willing to do whatever it is that God calls me to do, no matter what it costs me? That's the kind of man that Tychicus was. And Paul is honoring him, encouraging him, and allowing him to do what Paul can't do himself. He trusted him with this message of the gospel that we are blessed to have today. We also see someone that Paul is focused on that's not even mentioned in this passage And that is Timothy. Remember, Timothy is the pastor of the church at Ephesus. So he writes this gospel to the Ephesians. And it goes to Timothy. Timothy reads it first. Then he stands up and he delivers it to the rest of the church. So Paul is helping this young man, Timothy, who he helped to disciple, who he led to the Lord, and then he sent him as one of his best guys to go pastor this church that he planted in Ephesus in the middle of this cultural nightmare, this center of worship of all the Greek and the Roman gods. This place, Pastor uh, Chad said a few weeks ago that you could compare it with Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what Ephesus was. It was an epicenter 
of pagan worship and pagan practices, and it was totally against the gospel. Yet, that is where we learn in Acts 19 that that's where the Apostle Paul ministered for over two years. Started this church, saw many people come to Christ, and then he sent Timothy there. And by writing this letter, he's serving Timothy, serving the church, and supporting him in the middle of a very difficult assignment. And by the way, this morning, I just want to say this. Beware of a leader who's all about themselves. Paul is a man that's focused on other people rather than himself. He's a pastor to pastors. And yet he's a man that's not all about himself. He's focused on others. Beware of a leader who's focused on themselves. And be double careful of a pastor who's all about himself. Pastors have to meet biblical qualifications, and by the way, humility is one of those qualifications of a pastor. The Bible clearly tells us, actually, the Apostle Paul, think about this, the Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul as a pastor to write down what the qualifications of a pastor are. So think about Paul writing this list. I'm going to read this list in just a moment. He's writing this list. I think in the middle of this list, he may have just set his pen down and said, okay, this disqualifies me. How can I ever live up to this? Being above reproach, how can I do all of these things? Yet through the power of the Holy Spirit, the sanctifying work in our lives, pastors are not perfect, but they're called to be people of integrity. Listen to this list. This is, this is what a pastor is supposed to be like, and this defines the life of the Apostle Paul. It said he must be devoted to his wife. The pastor's children must be in submission. Not perfect, but in submission. A pastor should be a faithful steward. They must be humble, not arrogant. Gentle, not quick-tempered. They must be sober, not a drunkard or an addicted to substances. A pastor must be peaceful, not violent. They must have financial integrity and not be greedy for gain. A pastor must be Someone who shows hospitality, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, able to teach, spiritually mature, respectable, and they must be an example to the flock. This is the type of man that Paul was. He was focused on others rather than himself. We also see, moving on through this passage... That Paul is a man who is focused on the mission rather than his circumstances. Paul was focused on his mission rather than his circumstances. He's writing to a church that he planted from prison. He's in prison and he's thinking about his mission. Even though he could not walk out of the cell and get on a boat and go to see them... He sends somebody else and he writes a letter and serves the church and the other churches in the middle of his difficult circumstances. Think about this. The mission that God sent Paul on was to preach the gospel, to make disciples of all nations. It's the same mission that we have this morning. But the problem is that so many people stop focusing on the mission because it gets so difficult because our circumstances are so tough things happen that we never expected and so we give up on the mission and yet Paul is a man who's in prison he's an ambassador of Christ things aren't going the way he thinks they should have gone but he's a man on a mission not his own mission God's mission and he's focused on doing what he can do if we focus on not being able to do what some other people can do, we're never going to do anything. We all have people that we look up to. And we all have people that we wish we could be like them. And we had their gifts and their abilities and their talents. But Paul was a man who just focused on the mission that God called him to do. And he wasn't trying to be anybody else. He was being himself. There was so much he couldn't do from a prison cell. But you know what he could do? He could pick up a pen and he could write a letter 
And he could send his friends to go do what he could do. And he accomplished the mission that God entrusted him with through others. The fastest way for us to get off mission in this world is to focus on our circumstances. You want to become discouraged, distracted, ineffective? Focus on your circumstances and stop focusing on the mission that God sent you on. Jesus said he was going to build his church. He said he was going to use us to do that. But he's the one responsible for building the church. So what do we have to do? We have to obey. We have to share the gospel. We have to love others. We have to be a light in the darkness and trust the Holy Spirit to accomplish what only he can do. Paul's focused on his mission rather than his circumstances. We also see that Paul is focused on the gospel rather than his culture. Paul is writing this closing farewell in a letter that is saturated with the gospel. Think back about all the time we've spent in Ephesians. We, we study about the outline, what, what Paul's trying to accomplish. And if we outline this book, it's broken down into two parts. Our belief and our behavior. Or we could say it this way, our doctrine, our teaching, and our duty. Or salvation and sanctification. He tells us in the beginning this glorious explanation of who we were, what Christ did for us, how we got saved. This new reality in Christ. That's the title of this series. We are in Christ. He explains what that means and then Somewhere around the end of chapter 3, he stops and transitions, and he starts talking about, since this is your reality, this is how you need to act. Since this is what you believe, this needs to be your behavior. And he spends time telling us how we need to live our lives in light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. So he's focused on the gospel rather than the culture that's around him. So many churches today get so bogged down in the darkness of the culture that they forget to shine the light of the gospel. Yes, we have an enemy that is fierce. Yes, our lives are in danger. We're in peril. But greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. The power of the gospel can overcome this culture every single time if we simply share it. And if we simply live it out. So what is this gospel? If we look back and read through the gospel of this epistle of Ephesians, Paul paints a beautiful picture of the gospel in this book. And he gives us the essentials of the gospel. Somebody asked the question one time, what do you have to know to become a Christian? What do you have to believe? You don't have to be a theologian to be saved. Do do we all realize that? You don't have to know everything about the gospel. Just like you don't have to know what's happening in in an airplane and you don't have to understand the laws of aerodynamics to be able to sit in a seat on the airplane and fly. Right? You can enjoy the benefits of something without understanding everything about how it goes. But the gospel is a specific message and we have to have faith in that specific message. And in the person of Jesus Christ, if we're going to be saved. So what are the essentials of the gospel? I believe there are four essential things that if you do not include these things in sharing the gospel, it's no longer the gospel. If we lose one of these four things, we've lost the gospel. And there are these four things. Number one, God. Number two, sin. Number three, Christ. And then four is response. God Sin, Christ, response. There are a lot of churches today that are trying to share the gospel, but they don't want to talk about sin. If you don't understand sin, church, you're never going to understand the Savior. If you don't understand the darkness, it's not going to make any sense that he wants to give you light. If you don't understand that you're bound in your chains of sin Why would it make any sense for him to tell you that you can be set free? If you don't understand that you're dead in your trespasses and in your sin, why would you call on the Holy Spirit to give you new life? 
We have to understand the bad news of sin if we're going to understand the good news of the gospel. But so many churches have stopped sharing the truth about sin. Jesus talked about sin. Every one of the apostles talked about sin. The Bible, Scripture, is full of it. The Holy Spirit convicts men of sin through the preaching of the gospel. And yet so many in our world today have stopped talking about that. So what did Paul do? Did Paul employ these four elements? God, sin, Christ, response. Let's look back at Ephesians chapter 1. Let's, let's travel back in time a year, okay? Let's go back to where we started out this journey. Flip back with me if you have your Bibles or your apps open. I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 1 starting in verse 1. What does Paul start out with when he explains the gospel? Listen to this. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for the adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, in which he has blessed us in the beloved. Verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses or sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. Do you see how focused Paul is on God? If people don't understand our glorious, our holy God, the gospel's not going to make any sense to them. They've got to understand that he is the creator, that he is the one to whom we are accountable. It is appointed unto every man once to die, and after this, the judgment. We will all give an account of ourselves before Jesus Christ. They have to understand God. And how does the Bible start out? In the beginning, God. You've got to understand him before you understand the gospel. If you get down to verse 13, he starts talking about the Holy Spirit. And you see that in 13 verses, he's drawn this beautiful picture of the cooperation within the Trinity between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And God is such a part of the gospel. It has been said that God is the gospel. The good news is the story of God reaching down to mankind. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. But it starts with him. But quickly it moves into this topic of sin. Ephesians chapter 2. What does Paul say? Verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our mind and our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Paul did not sugarcoat the gospel. He said, you were children of wrath, and those who are lost are still children of wrath. They're under God's righteous judgment, and they're in danger of that judgment if they don't believe in Jesus Christ and trust in him. So Paul started with God. He moved into sin, but quickly, he says in chapter 2, verse 4, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And then he calls for a response. In chapter 2, verse 8, he says, For by grace, you have been saved through faith. We have to believe the gospel. That God is good and glorious and holy. He is our creator. We're accountable to him. But we've sinned against him. So he sent Jesus Christ 
so that whoever would believe in him through his sacrifice on the cross could be saved and changed and become children of God. But you have to respond to that personally. You have to believe the gospel. And you have to say yes to Jesus. This is not a popular message today, and it wasn't a popular message when Paul preached it. When Paul stood up and preached, you were once children of wrath. And you're in danger of the judgment if you rebel against God. People didn't give him applause. They didn't stand up and give him a standing ovation. They picked up rocks and they stoned him. And in our culture, the gospel is offensive. But if we don't understand the offense of the gospel, we're not going to understand the glorious rescue that Jesus Christ provided for all who believe in him. Paul was a man focused on the gospel rather than his culture. Number four, and finally, Paul is focused on Jesus rather than his enemy. Paul is focused on Jesus rather than his enemy. Paul's enemy, we talked about the enemy last work, last week. It's our enemy, the world, the flesh, and the devil. The devil is operating this world system to lure us away from God, and he offers our flesh all the bad things that we don't need, all the things that tempt us to go away from Jesus Christ, all the things that tempt us to trust in ourselves and in this world rather than trusting in the gospel. And Satan fought the apostle Paul every single step of the way, and the man that he used to fight against the apostle Paul was the Caesar. His name was Nero. He was sitting on the throne. He was the emperor of Rome, the most powerful man in the world. But we don't see Paul sitting around being afraid of the Caesar. We see Paul opposing the Caesar and telling people, Caesar is not Lord. Jesus is Lord. Which is what ultimately got the Apostle Paul killed, according to history. But who was this man, this enemy, that was set against Paul and against the gospel, who was persecuting the church? Here's the legacy of Nero, and this is just a few things. First of all, Nero murdered his own mother for political gain. That's, that's not a good thing on your resume right there. <laughs> that's the legacy this guy left behind. And it, it just doesn't get much better from there. He killed his wives, plural. Multiple wives were executed by him because they stood in the way of what he wanted. He was a man who was very sexually immoral. He abused men, women, children openly, publicly, unashamedly because he was the emperor of the Roman Empire, the most powerful man in the world. And he was an evil man. He blamed Christians for burning Rome. He persecuted Christians, crucifying them, set them on fire to light his gardens at night. Proclaiming, oh, you think Jesus is Lord? Well, let's see if he can save you from this fire. He would put them on this pyre, pour whatever he needed to on top of them, and light them on fire and let them burn. To send a message, you follow Jesus, this is what happens to you. And yet we see the Apostle Paul was not afraid of him. This is the same emperor that executed Peter. It was under the Roman government that James was executed. And ultimately, every single one of the apostles, except for the Apostle John, who was exiled. But Paul wasn't afraid of Caesar. As a matter of fact... Paul appealed to Caesar. He said, I want to go share the gospel in Rome to Caesar. He believed that Jesus could save Nero from his sins. And he went to Rome ultimately because he said, I appeal to Caesar. I want to go share the gospel before him. I want to present my case before him. How was it that Paul lived his life focused on Jesus and refused to be afraid of the Caesar. 
Well, Paul wrote these words. I think this may give us a glimpse into his life. He said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You know, if I live, I'm going to share the gospel. And if you kill me, I'm going to be with Jesus. You can't stop someone like that who's focused on Jesus rather than their enemy. And here's the difference between Nero, the Caesar, and Jesus Christ. Nero wanted Paul dead. Jesus died to save Paul. That's the difference. The type of king Jesus was and the type of king that Nero was. Jesus died to save Paul. I want to remind you that Paul was a murderer. He was executing Christians. He did not believe the gospel until Jesus appeared to him, struck him blind, and said, why are you fighting against me? And he said, who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus, the one that you're fighting against. He said, I'm going to use you to share the gospel and spread the gospel throughout the Roman Empire, and you're going to suffer Many things, great things, because of my name. And Paul said, yes. Because he had seen the risen Christ. He understood and believed the gospel. But Jesus didn't just die to save his soul. Jesus had protected Paul during his ministry. Yes, Paul suffered many, many things. He'd been through great trials, and God told him when he got saved, he was going to suffer many things. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23, Paul gives us a list of all that he had been through. Listen to this. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death, five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes less one, so 39 lashes, Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger, in thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all of the churches. Paul said, who is weak if I'm not weak? And yet he went through all of that, focusing on Jesus. Because that was the prize, that was the goal, that was the focus of his life. He was not going to spend his life focusing on the enemy of the gospel. He focused on the one that the gospel was all about. Jesus Christ himself. Paul stood before Jewish leaders, Roman governors, kings, and eventually Nero, the Caesar himself. Who, according to church history, beheaded Paul at the end of his ministry. Paul gave his very life. And why would he do this? Because he was focused on Jesus. He was focused on the gospel. He's focused on his missions. He was focused on others, loving others, sharing the gospel with others. He was living his life for Jesus. And he knew that Jesus was sovereign over all human powers, over all nations, over all kingdoms. And Paul declared this, I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul was a man who was focused on Jesus Christ. And I want to ask us a question this morning. All that Paul went through. All of his trials, all of his tribulations, all of his persecution. He still kept serving Jesus in spite of all that. And if you're anything like me, we live 
focusing on our circumstances and our enemy rather than focusing on Jesus. We haven't been through, I was going to say half, we haven't been through a fraction of what Paul's been through. And yet we're the kind of people, let let me personalize this, I'm the kind of person, I I know you're probably a little bit better than I am, I'm the kind of person that will sit at a traffic light and if the person in front of me takes half of a second before they go when the light turns green, I'm upset because they're standing in my way. I've got things to do. Anybody else like that? What about fast food? That's one of my pet peeves. You know, they're supposed to be about the customer, right? Right? But if, if, you know, I have to wait at fast food if, if the drive through takes too long. We expect everybody to be like Chick-fil-A, right? For now, right? I mean, that's, that's everybody's got to be get me in, get me out. It's, it's all about me. We're the kind of people that will go to a five-star restaurant if we have to wait too long on the waiting list or the server does something wrong. We're, we're upset. Guys, we're living in a different, a different dimension, <laughs> a different universe than the Apostle Paul was living in. We don't know how to suffer for Jesus Christ. Your food being cold or getting the wrong thing delivered to your table is not suffering. That's called we're spoiled, rotten, and we think we deserve too much. And we're very selfish people. And we're focused on ourselves. And we start focusing on something else. Then we can experience the kind of success that the Apostle Paul experience not worldly success but success for the gospel so i want to ask you the question as i close out what is the point of your focus what is your goal what is your end paul tells us in philippians chapter 3 verse 10 what he wanted what he was aiming for he says that i may know jesus that i may know him And the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, that I may be like him and become like him in his death. Paul was a man who lived a focused life. Paul was a man who was focused on the right things. So what are we focused on this morning? Are we focused on ourself, our circumstances, our culture, our enemy? Or are we focused on Jesus rather than the enemy? Are we focused on the gospel rather than this culture? Are we focused on our mission rather than our circumstances? And are we focused on others rather than ourselves? When Paul stood before Jesus, the words he heard were well done good and faithful servant and that's exactly what Paul was living for for me to live is Christ and to die is gain and I pray that we are living lives that will not just get us into heaven I'm saved but that's enough for me no lives that are submitted to Jesus Christ serving others sharing the gospel on mission For the glory of Jesus. So that when we stand before him. We'll hear the words. Well done. Good and faithful servant. I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Because as I shared. In the essentials of the gospel. The final essential is response. I wonder if there's someone here this morning. That does not know Jesus as your. Personal Lord and Savior. If you've never believed in Jesus. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He died on the cross for your sins to save you and to rescue you, to bring you from death to life, from darkness to light. And if you believe in him, place your faith and your trust in him, you can be saved. I can promise you this morning, whatever it is that you're living for, it will disappoint you. It will let you down. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you want to be saved, you have to come through Jesus. You have to believe and bow your knee to Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. So I want to invite you this morning to say yes to Jesus. He did everything that needed to be done for you to be saved. 
You simply have to respond and receive that. The most familiar verse in all the Bibles, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. that Whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I mentioned in the sermon that every one of us will give an account of himself to God. If you're not ready to stand before Jesus, you need to ask him to forgive your sins, to come into your heart, give him your life, surrender to him as your Lord and your Savior. He said, if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away and all things are become new. So as we pause in this moment of prayer and response, I want to ask you, do you know Jesus? Will you believe the gospel? Will you say yes to Jesus? And Christians, are you focused on the right things? I had the privilege of studying and preparing this sermon this week. And I finished it last night, went over just to make sure everything was wrapped up, got up this morning, read over it. Everything was where it needed to be. Felt like I was teaching what God wanted me to teach this morning. I got in my Jeep and started driving to church. And the country station that was on my Jeep was playing a Christian song. And it's a song from my childhood. And it's actually the sermon I just preached. And I want to close the service with this song. And if anybody knows this song, I want to invite you to sing it with me this morning. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold I'd rather be his than have riches untold I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands I'd rather
thank you for your word that speaks to our hearts. And Lord, I ask that you would not just let these words ring in our ears, but God, may they be planted deep in our hearts. And Lord, I ask that you would change our lives, make us into the image of Jesus Christ. Lord, may our lives be focused on you, on the mission that you sent us on, on the gospel and on serving and loving others the way that you loved and served us. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would do what only you can do. May we truly respond to the gospel and live out the truth of your word. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. You guys are dismissed. Thank you. Thank you for joining us online today. If you have any questions, please hit us up on our website. And remember, we would love to see you in person next week.